Welcome students. Today in this video lecture we'll be talking about particle accelerators. So this is an interesting topic of nuclear physics. We study it in nuclear physics but it has a lot of applications in different fields and even in our daily lives we use particle accelerators in some way or the other. So that makes particle accelerators very interesting. So let's go through the presentation. So what are these particle accelerators? So if we talk about accelerators, the first thing that comes to our mind maybe are the accelerators that we have in our bikes, in our cars. So is it something similar? There, those accelerators that we are talking about in our cars and in our bikes, for instance, we use these accelerators to increase the speed. Similarly, these particular accelerators are nothing but these are devices which can impart high energies to charged particles. Particles, particularly uh, smaller particles in the atomic and subatomic domain. So these are devices that impart high energies to charged atomic and subatomic particles. So we were talking about high energies. It basically means high kinetic energies. So these particle accelerators, they accelerate the particles to very high velocities, imparting very high kinetic energies to these particles. So why is it important? They are used for various studies in nuclear physics particle physics and high energy physics which re requires energetic particles so we need to do some studies in nuclear physics particle physics or high energy physics these are terms which are very close to one another we need high energetic particles we collide make them collide or we need to induce some nuclear transformations some reactions. For all these studies, basically we need energetic particles. Though particles, energetic particles are available in nature in the form of cosmic radiations. These are energetic particles which are coming from outer space, but in the laboratory conditions also, we need particles which are optimized to energy levels as per requirement and as and when needed. So for that purpose, we need particle accelerators. But does it mean that particle accelerators are only used in laboratories? Not so, because they are extensively used in different fields related to our day-to-day -day lives also. So any nuclear physicist or high energy physicist will recognize this photo. This is nothing but the Large Hadron Collider. This is a particle accelerator that is there in CERN, C -E -R -N, that is European Center for Nuclear Research. So this is a cyclic kind of an accelerator which has a diameter of around 20, uh, sorry, the whole circumference, the path is around 27 kilometers. And it's in the border between uh, Geneva and Switzerland. So this is a huge particle accelerator. This was first started in the year 2008, but still it's one of the most powerful and largest particle accelerator in the world presently. And this is another picture. This is in the Brookhaven National Laboratory in New York in the United States. This is a kind of a cyclic accelerator. So you can see the person standing over here. So this can be the size of the accelerators in the laboratory conditions. So does it mean, again, that particular accelerators should be this big? But I was talking about using particular accelerators in our daily lives. So this is a picture of a cathode ray oscilloscope or, or a cathode ray tube, you can say. It's a cathode ray tube. It's nothing but a simple particle accelerator. So you can remember the picture tubes of, of the earlier days, televisions, or the cathode ray oscilloscopes that we have in our laboratories. So 
it's nothing but there is a filament which produces charged particles particularly the electrons they are accelerated through an electric field passing through the field they strike a fluorescent screen once it strikes the screen it produces a spot so this is a simple example again this is an accelerator principle is almost same but here we are talking about very high high energetic particles that's why the sizes are very big but even this is a particle accelerator in the true sense then this is under picture which you might have seen or you might not have seen this is basically a person who is undergoing the process of radiotherapy so these are machines which are accelerators they generate high energetic particles these particles are used to treat people from cancers so these are some uses of particle accelerators we'll be talking about it so what is the basic principle behind particle accelerators so these are basically used to accelerate particles such as electrons protons alpha particles and other heavy ions ions why because we need charged particles again why because only charged particles can be affected by electric and magnetic fields so these are light particles that we are talking about the electrons negatively charged the protons positively charged alpha particles two units of positive charge and other heavy ions compared comparatively heavier ions we can't accelerate very heavy ions very very heavy ions why because then will require much stronger electric fields to attain some value of energy so usually we talk about accelerating particles in the atomic and the subatomic domain and smaller particles so its basic principle of particle accelerators is that charged particles are affected by electric and magnetic fields as they pass through them so question here is how is it used to accelerate particles so let's go one step behind suppose i have an electron it's a negatively charged particle so i have two electrodes in between which i can apply a potential difference of 1 volt now if the electron is released somewhere near the negative electrode if it is left free the positive electrode will attract it and the electron will accelerate through the potential difference of 1 volt so the amount of energy that the electron attains when it is accelerated through a potential difference of 1 volt is called 1 electron volt this is a new term of energy that we use or this is a term or unit of energy that we use in nuclear physics and atomic physics because the normal unit of energy that we talk about joule it is very big in the atomic and sub atomic domain so 1 electron volt is equal to 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 joule so that is the conversion between electron volt and joule so what i was talking about accelerating an electron through a potential difference of 1 volt it gives me an energy of 1 electron volt so what can be done so what can be done is we can have a very high voltage and we can accelerate the particle through that voltage so that it attains very high energy that is one way second way is we can apply a small voltage multiple number of times so accelerators can work in both ways some accelerators they generate a very high voltage and the particles are allowed to accelerate through them once or the other way around i have a small voltage which can be applied multiple number of times means the particle is allowed to accelerate through that voltage multiple number of times so final result is that we attain a high energetic particle so this depending upon the particles that are accelerated 
the design and the final energy that we need to achieve, these particle accelerators can be classified into different types. So the first type of accelerators that we'll be talking about is the linear accelerator or the LINAC. So it is an accelerator used to accelerate particles to high energies again by the application of an oscillating electric field. Oscillating electric field means it's a time varying electric field. It goes from positive to negative within a fixed time. And basically here it's the peak voltage is small or rather it's a small source of oscillating potential. So in the linear accelerator, the field is applied to the particle across gaps in a linear structure. We we'll look into the structure of this accelerator. So what happens is this field is applied multiple number of times. So in each passes through the gaps, the particles are accelerated, gaining energy. So as many number of gaps are there, as much the particles will be accelerated. So the final energy attained in the particle accelerator or the LINAC is the sum of the energies attained across all the gaps. So more the number of gaps, more will be the energy attained. So let's look into the construction of the linear accelerator. As I told you, this is the linear accelerator you can see here. Just one second. Okay. The linear accelerator, it has hollow cylindrical electrodes of increasing length. You can see here, this is shorter compared to this. This is longer than this successive electrodes are longer than one another and this yellow one here this is the source of the particle the particles enters this and there is a finite gap between these electrodes these are hollow cylindrical metallic electrodes and the path that the particle follows through the electrodes is a linear path hence the name linac and you can see here alternate sets of electrodes are connected to one another. One, three, five, and so on. These are connected to one another. Then second, fourth, sixth, etc. will be connected to one another. And in between these two sets of electrodes, a high frequency oscillating AC voltage is applied. Okay, so as I told you. It consists of hollow cylindrical electrodes of increasing lengths. Why increasing? We'll talk about it. Alternate electrodes are connected to one another. The high frequency AC source is applied between the two sets of electrodes. And the whole arrangement, sorry, this is a typing mistake, is enclosed in a highly evacuated tube. So this whole structure will be enclosed in a highly evacuated tube. And the length of the whole LINAC means the number of electrodes that will be there, it depends upon the final energy that is needed. So it can be as long as 5 to 6 kilometers, depending on the final energy that needs to be attained. So what about the walking? So here is there is a small animation here. Basically what happens is, this is the oscillating electric oscillating AC field that is applied between alternate sets of electrodes. So it keeps on changing with time as I told you. So alternate sets of electrodes, they become positive and negative. Let's see this. You can see here, this is positive first, this is negative, this is positive, this is negative. When the field is in this direction, then once the field changes, the polarity it changes. The direction of the electric field it changes. Okay, so after every half cycle, you can see here, after every half cycle, the polarity of the electrodes, they change. Okay, so this kind of animations are there. So let us say this is a source of particles which produces positively charged particles. So this is a positively charged particle. So at the moment it is released, 
this electrode is negative so the particle accelerates and it enters this electrode once it enters this electrode it enters with a finite velocity so this electrode has a finite length so what happens the particle it takes a finite amount of time to travel through this electrode now if the frequency of this applied field is arranged or is adjusted in such a way that once the particle reaches this gap here this becomes negative so once the particle it reaches the gap this becomes negative so this is a synchronization condition which can be achieved if the half cycle time for half cycle of this ac is equal to the time taken by the particle to travel through this tube so this condition of synchronization so what will happen once the particle reaches here this tube becomes negative so again it is accelerated through this now the particle will enter this tube with a higher velocity compared to this so for the particle to be synchronized with the external electric field this tube needs to be longer in length so that the time taken by the particle to travel through this tube because it's moving at a higher velocity is same as the time taken by the particle to travel through this tube so in that case again the time taken by the particle to travel through this longer tube with longer higher velocity will be equal to half the time of half cycle of this ac so again when the particle reaches this point this becomes negative so the particle enters here higher velocity longer length so it take again takes the same time so this condition of synchronization needs to be achieved to make possible the linac so that is how basically the linac works so at every passes through a gap the particle keeps on gaining energy so if as many number of gaps are there that will the more will be the final energy gained by the particle so whatever is it telling the ion say positive enters the first electrode so inside it the particles or the particle will move with a constant velocity as there is no electric field inside the electrode so this is from electrostatics a metallic chamber inside a metallic chamber there is no electric field so once the particle enters the electrode it doesn't experience any electric field so the acceleration of the particle takes place only in the gaps between the electrodes inside it is free from the electric field and it moves with a constant velocity so it takes a finite time to travel through the electrode as it reaches the gap the second electron becomes negative this is all that i was discussing so it accelerates in the gap and enters the next electrode with higher velocity but electrode but the successive electrodes are longer so it takes same time and the process continues it keeps on going on and on so that forms the theory for elinac finding out the synchronization condition finding out the length of the successive tubes so that forms the basic theory of a linear accelerator so the basic principle of operation of the linac is the synchronization between the oscillating field and the particle that means the particle every time it reaches a gap between the electrodes the field should change its direction and hence the electrodes should change its polarity that will be possible if the time taken by a particle to travel through an electrode is equal to time of half cycle of the ac so this is what the time taken by the particle to travel through an electrode should be equal to half cycle of the applied field or half the time period of the applied field so that each time the particle reaches a gap the polarity of the electrodes changes now going to the details of the theory if q is the charge on the particles and v not is the peak value of the oscillating field so here let us say we have something like this 
I'm drawing with the mouse so it becomes a bit difficult anyway this is the oscillating field let me say okay so the peak value of the oscillating field is this one we are talking about let's say this is v naught right so this is the peak value we are talking about so if q is the charge on the particles and v naught is the peak value of the oscillating field then in each gap the particle acquires an energy q v naught ev so v naught is in terms of volts q is the charge of the particle so ev is in terms of electron volts i was talking about so in each gap it attains an energy q v naught now if there are n gaps the total energy acquired by the particle in n gaps will be n times of q v naught so n q v naught e v now if v n this is small v n be the velocity in the nth gap then the total kinetic energy acquired in the nth gap so each successive gap let me say the particle attains some energy its velocity is increased so let us say in the final gap nth gap we are not telling what is n in general let me say there are n gaps in the nth gap the velocity is let us say vn right so in the nth gap after the nth gap the kinetic energy acquired by the particle will be half m vn square where m is the mass of the particle now this energy is gained by the particles being accelerated across each gap so that is equal to this energy so we have to equate these two energies should be equal so this is the energy given to the particle across n gaps by the applied potential so when it reaches the final gap it has a velocity vn so this is the kinetic energy of the particle so energy this kinetic energy is gained from this energy so these two terms should be equal so equating both the terms n q v not is equal to half m v n square capital v not is the peak value or we can find an expression for the velocity of the particle in the nth gap so that in terms of the peak value the charge n is the number of gaps and then the hence the number of electrodes and m is the mass of the particle now if f is the frequency of the oscillating field the time for half cycle of the field is 1 by 2f this was the time we are talking about the time for half cycle of the field is 1 by 2f now this time should be equal to the time taken by the particle to to travel through an electrode now if we consider any electrode nth electrode in general we are talking about so the time taken by the particle to pass through the nth electrode of length ln is ln by vn where vn is the velocity of the particle inside the electrode so it depends upon the electrode because successive electrodes are longer in length and successively the velocity keeps on increasing so we are considering in general any electrode suppose the ln nth electrode having a length ln and inside it the velocity is vn so the time taken by the particle to travel through that electrode is ln by vn so for synchronization condition this was the condition we are talking about the time of half cycle of the ac should be equal to the time taken by the particle to travel through any electrode and can be 1 2 3 4 5 etc so this is the condition of synchronization or we can find out an expression for ln is equal to vn by 2f where vn is the velocity of the particle in the nth electrode putting the value of vn we can have an expression for the length of the electrode that is equal to 1 by 2f root over twice n q v not by m so this is basically the condition that needs to be satisfied in a linear accelerator that 
if f is the frequency of the applied AC, q is the charge of the particle to be accelerated, m is the mass of the particle to be accelerated, and v0 is the peak value of the applied voltage, and f is the frequency of the applied AC, then the length of the nth electrode should be equal to this. Suppose first electrode n is equal to 1, here n will be equal to 1. L2, 2. So this is the formula which helps designing a linear accelerator. This gives us the condition for determining the length of the successive electrodes in a linear accelerator. So if this condition is satisfied, the particles will be satisfying the synchronization condition and it makes possible the LINAC. So, as I told you, this equation gives us the condition for the length of the electrode so that the synchronization condition can be achieved. So, let us see what are the advantages and limitations of a linear accelerator. So, in a linear accelerator, as I told you, relatively smaller voltages are needed. Other way around, some accelerators are there. We have other accelerators where we have a generator of very high voltage and we apply it once to the particle. Here what we are doing, a smaller voltage, we are applying it number of times. So it's easier to deal with smaller voltages than very high voltage. So this is one advantage of a linear accelerator. It is economical, economical in a sense. Comparatively, it is economical compared to other accelerators. And also it provides a well collimated beam of particles. However, if I need high energy particles, the number of electrodes needs to be more. So, what happens? The length of the linear accelerators can be very, very large. It becomes difficult to handle. Also, it requires very high frequency oscillators. So, that is all about the linear accelerators. So next lecture, we'll be talking about the next type of accelerators that we need to study, which are the cyclotrons. Thank you.